Do you have a date on that? Is it today or? Wow, you can sing that all day as far as I'm concerned. Well, good morning, everyone. How many of you were already here yesterday? Oh, wow. How many of you were not here yesterday? Oh, you sat in the back because you're embarrassed? Oh, well, we welcome you all. We're going to have a wonderful day. You may be seated. Um, as those of you who were here yesterday will know, um, we are sorely missing the presence of our good friend, Dr. Ed Heinsen from Liberty University uh, in Virginia. And he caught the shingles. But he sent us a copy of um, a video of the seven churches of Revelation. Now let me see what he's doing this morning. Oh my goodness. He's going to zap us with the Antichrist and false prophet. Woo! Revelation 12. Oh, let's get on with it. I, I don't know what to do except pray. Amen. Welcome to you all. Let's hear from Ed Heinsen. If you won't come to Christ in a time of relative peace and prosperity, you think you're going to come to Christ when it's going to cost you your life? Hello, I'm Ed Heinsen. I love taking the Word of God and explaining it to the people of God. You see, the Bible was written so that we could understand it. Uh, it's not meant to be a closed book. It's not meant to be so complicated. We don't know what it's all about. And right now, we're in the middle of a study of the book of Revelation. And some people say, oh, that's the most difficult of all. Not really. Uh, the big picture in the book is very clear. Uh, ultimately, the world is going to end in chaos. Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to set up his kingdom on earth and reign and rule over this planet. But in the meantime, he rules in our hearts from heaven. Uh, that's really what the book is all about. And today, we're going to see seven symbolic players in the great end times drama. If you really want to know what Revelation is all about, you have to know who are these seven people. What are they doing? When are they doing it? And why in the world is this happening? And what will it ultimately lead to? Get your Bible open to Revelation chapter 12, and we'll take a look. If you've ever been to a Major League Baseball game and you're sitting in the stands wondering who's going to be in the game today, right in the middle of the playbook, there's always a scorecard, the lineup card. Who's on first? Who's at second? Who's at shortstop? who's in the outfield, etc. who's pitching, who's catching. Well, right in the middle of the book of Revelation, there's a scorecard, if you will. God gives us a lineup of the seven symbolic players in the great end times drama. If you have your Bible, take it in turn to Revelation chapter 12. And today we'll look at both chapter 12 and chapter 13. In the 12th chapter, the scripture says, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon uh, and the stars uh, in her crown, etc. And you might circle the woman, the first symbolic player in the story. And as we read on, we discover the woman is pregnant. She's about to deliver a child. But in verse 3, there appeared another wonder, a great red dragon. So you might circle the red dragon. Uh, and the red dragon becomes a symbol in the passage of Satan. He tells you that very clearly in verse 9. It's that old serpent, the devil, or Satan, and he wants to destroy the baby. And then in verse 5, she brought forth a male child who was destined to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Well, we know from the rest of the book of Revelation, the one who rules with a rod of iron is Jesus Christ. 
So the picture is a woman is about to deliver a baby. Satan, the dragon, wants to kill the baby, stop him from coming to rule. And then the passage goes on to say, but the male child was caught up to God and to his throne. Obviously a reference to the ascension of Christ. The baby Jesus wasn't caught up to the throne of God. This is the adult person of Jesus Christ who after the resurrection in the ascension is caught away. And it's interesting, if you could read this in the Greek text, it's the word harpazo, the word for rapture, the same word Paul uses of the rapture of the believers. He's caught away bodily into heaven itself. And then in verse 7, there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. So in this chapter, we begin with four symbolic players. The woman who's going to deliver the male child, the dragon who wants to destroy the child, the child himself, and then Michael, the archangel, who battles the forces of the dragon in heaven. It's also in this chapter that we discover the dragon swept a third of the stars, he says, from heaven in his fall. Uh, that would give us an indication that if Satan is the dragon, then the fallen stars are the fallen angels, that a third of the angels then fell Marshall with doesn't Satan. come in. <laughs> Two thirds did not. Uh, that God remains in power and in control in heaven, and that this spiritual conflict is accelerating in the end times. Now from the rest of the Bible, we know that Satan fell in eternity past, but Satan still has access to the heavens. In the book of Job, he comes among the angels to argue with God about why have you blessed Job, uh, etc. He's still called in the New Testament the prince of the power of the air, uh, the lion who wars about seeking whom he may devour, etc. You don't get the idea from the New Testament writers that Satan is already bound, or certainly not already in the pit, in the abyss. And yet there are well-meaning people who try to say that. Oh, I think Satan is bound by the power of the cross. Bound in the sense that he cannot steal the salvation of a believer? Yes, I agree. But not bound in the sense that he cannot get out, cannot deceive the nations. No, he's still the prince of the power of the air, who now, present tense, Paul said, works in the hearts of the disobedient. In this passage, you see the dragon still active, but there's coming a time when he will be cast out of the heavenlies and limited to the earth, no longer the prince of the power of the air. Once he's cast out by Michael, he's confined to the earth, and he's confined for a limited, short period of time, and the scripture defines that for us uh, as time, times and a half a time for three and a half times or three and a half years. You see, if you follow the career of Satan in the Bible, he loses his position of leadership and worship in heaven as an angel. He's confined to the atmospheric heavens of the universe. Then he's cast to the earth, and pretty soon he's going to be thrown into the abyss, into the pit for a thousand years, and he's ultimately going to end up in the lake of fire. Satan ends up the great loser in the book of Revelation. But at this point, as John sees the future, he sees this great cosmic conflict is still ongoing. The battle between Michael and Satan, the battle between the forces of God and the forces of Satan. But one of the questions we have to ask is, who's the woman? Now at first glance, some have said, well, it's got to be Mary. She was the mother of Jesus. Uh, or it's got to represent the church in some way, and she then represents the church. But I remind you, in the symbolism of the passage, the woman is not the symbol of the church, because the church is not the mother of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. You don't marry your mother, hopefully. Uh, your bride and your mother are not the same person. The church is pictured in the New Testament as the bride of Christ. But this woman is pictured as the mother of Christ, the ancestor of Christ, and she's clothed with the sun and the moon and the stars. Where does that symbolism come from? Well, as we've seen before, over half the verses in the book of Revelation draw their symbols from the Old Testament. In Joseph's dream, in the book of Genesis, Joseph sees the family of Israel 
has the sun, the moon, and the 12 stars. His brothers understand what he's dreaming about. You think all of us are going to bow down to you in some way? No, the symbolism here is of the nation of Israel. Israel is, in essence, the mother of Christ. How is Jesus presented in the New Testament? Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Jesus the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It traces his Jewish roots through the line of Abraham, through the line of David. That's why Jesus is called the son of David, a messianic term. You have that passage where Jesus is on his way into the city of Jericho and two blind men who can't see shout, son of David, have mercy on us. Even though they're physically blind with their heart, they can see he's the Messiah, he's the king, he's the son of David, etc. Jesus will eventually heal them, but the whole point of the passage is, why cannot the leaders who have physical sight see that he's the son of David? The point in the passage here is not that the church is going to bring forth the male child. No, Jesus descends through the line of David, through the line of Abraham, through the line of Israel. The symbol is Israel. You say, why is that important? Because the fifth symbol at the end of the chapter uh, in verse 17 is the remnant of her seed being persecuted by the dragon. The church has been raptured to heaven. He can't touch them. So he's angry with the earthly people of God and he's trying to persecute and destroy the Jews. He chases them into the wilderness in the last days uh, and he's trying to persecute the seed of the woman. If it's the seed of the church, then you'd have the church going through the tribulation period. It's the seed of the woman of Israel. They're still here during the time of tribulation. You say, how do you know that? Because God raises up two Jewish witnesses to speak to them where? In Jerusalem, the city where Jesus was crucified. And the two witnesses are going to proclaim the gospel to the people of Israel during the time of tribulation. And then when the Antichrist kills the two witnesses, that's in the 11th chapter of Revelation, and their bodies are lying dead in the street for three and a half days. The world is having a party and rejoicing, and all the world can see them. That wasn't really possible until modern times when you television transmission in real time all over the planet through the satellite systems. The whole world could be rejoicing at one time over two people dead in the streets of Jerusalem, but after three and a half days, the Spirit of God enters into them. They stand up, and then they're raptured up to heaven. Boy, I'd love to be watching CNN on that day. Uh, we're here in Jerusalem. The two guys are still dead. In the wait a minute, wait a minute. They're moving around. They're moving around. They're getting up. They're going up on live television. God sends a mini rapture with those two witnesses in Revelation 11 to say to the world, those people that were taken out before in the rapture, no, aliens didn't get them. Laser beams didn't zap them. I've called them home. I've taken the bride home to heaven. Why? because I'm declaring war on the world. And the last chance, the last opportunity is trust the Savior before it's too late. Then when you go to chapter 13, you have two more symbolic players. The beast out of the sea in verse 1 and the beast out of the earth in verse 11. The beast out of the sea is that person that we call elsewhere in the New Testament the Antichrist the one who is opposed to Christ, the one who is in place of Christ. And yet, interestingly, he's only called Antichrist, Antichristos in Greek, in John's letters. John calls him in the book of Revelation simply the beast. The beast who is at war with the lamb. And the lamb is going to triumph over the beast because he's not only the suffering lamb who died for our sins, he's the triumphal lamb who is destined to reign and rule as the lion of the tribe of Judah. The beast out of the sea, he describes as the epitome of blasphemy. Then we get all hung up on the details. The ten horns, the seven heads, etc. No, look at what he looks like in verse 2. A leopard, a bear, a lion, and the dragon gave him his power. Well, where do you see those same words used? The book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Those represented human kingdoms. 
the lion of Babylon, the bear of Media Persia, uh, the leopard of Greece, the monster of Rome, etc. The Antichrist is the epitome of all human government that is opposed to God and the things of God, and he's empowered by who? The dragon. You have, in a sense, a kind of unholy trinity with a small t. The dragon, the devil, the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, opposing the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of God. And as he describes him, he says that God gives him power from Satan himself. The dragon empowers him. God allows it as his act of judgment on the unbelieving world. And there was given to him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies in verse 5. And power was given to him for 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years. Those dates are used throughout the book that he rises to power very slowly, apparently, during the first half of the seven years of tribulation. But by the midpoint, he's in full power. He slays the two witnesses. He's trying to stop the work of God. He is trying to rule the world by himself. And he makes war, in verse 7, with the saints. And all that dwelled on the earth, verse 8, shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. Those that are not really saved are going to fall for the leadership, the authority, and the power of the Antichrist. Now, you may say to yourself, well, not me. Now, if people disappear, I'll know it's a rapture. Now, if I'm left behind, man, I, I better get saved as quick as I can here, uh, etc. If you won't come to Christ in a time of relative peace and prosperity, you think you're going to come to Christ when it's going to cost you your life? And you're going to be martyred for your faith? No, if you won't live for him, you'll never die for him. Don't kid yourself. You're as lost as a goat, and you know it. The power of God is not evidenced in your life anywhere, and you know that. You know that you don't have one iota of hope of ever standing in the presence of an all-holy God with all the things that have gone wrong in your life. You see, the only hope is all the things that went right when God sent Jesus into the world to take all our wrong on himself, all our evil deeds, all our terrible things on himself, and die in our place. That's the only payment that is sufficient for your sins for all eternity. And Jesus did that for you, and he bids you come to me now while there's hope, while there's time, before it is too late, because there's coming a time when it will be too late. And the Antichrist will deceive the world, and the Antichrist will rule in power and authority and eradicate anybody that stands against him. We've seen that kind of depravity in human leaders before, whether it's a Hitler or a Stalin or a Pol Pot or some radical dictator out of control. Humanity has this attitude, I want to be God. I want to rule. I want to be in charge. And if I have to eliminate God and the people of God and the things of God to get it done, I'll try to do it. So Satan tries to eliminate the idea of God from our thinking. Oh, surely there can't be a real divine personal God in a world that has evolved over billions and billions of years and you're just a little speck on the human scale. You don't really matter at all. And all of that thinking ultimately convinces us, let the leader be in charge. Let the media tell us what to believe or what to think or what to do, if the case may be. And the Antichrist will use all of that to his advantage one time to spin it in the direction he wants it to go and deceive the world. You say, how deceived are they going to be? Well, according to verse 11, he'll be assisted by a spiritual leader. There arose another beast out of the earth. And later in the book, he's clearly called the false prophet. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like the dragon. He spoke the message of Satan. Now, he looked religious. He tried to act religious, but what he said was right from the heart of the devil himself. And he exercised all the power of the first beast, and he caused all that dwell on the earth to worship the beast, the Antichrist. He's trying to get your attention away from God, the God of the Bible, the God of truth, the God of heaven, to worship the beast and his power and his material success and glory. And they'll worship him, and if they don't, fire will come down and devour them. So he has some kind of miraculous ability. And then he ultimately, verse 14, deceives 
all of those that dwell on the earth. How? By the image of the beast. Some kind of projected imagery of some sort. Now, I don't know if it's a hologramic image. The facts of the scripture in prophecy are clear. Jesus will come again. He will come to take the bride home to heaven. He will come to judge the earth, etc. Some of the details are a matter of interpretation. And beyond that, some are just a matter of speculation. And we have to understand that. Don't preach your speculations as though it were the facts. The facts are clear. He will empower some kind of image. I don't know if it's a statue, if it's a hologramic visual image. We are caught up in a culture that is obsessed with visual images. Visual images that appear to be real. And that would seem to me to be a very plausible explanation of what would come here in the future. He can give life and power to the image. And it can speak and talk to you. A literal visual image that can talk to you. Your phone can talk to you. Your computer can talk to you. That reality is already here. And then he caused all, both small and great, to receive a mark. The mark of the beast. In their right hand or in their forehead. Now that word mark, literally in Greek, karagma, means a tattoo technically, a cutting in the skin, a, a marking of some sort in the skin. And what is it? It's the mark, verse 17, of the beast, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. It is an insignia, it is a name, and it's a number. The computer card has all of that. The credit card has all of that. In other words, the icon may be the very literal icon of the future. I don't want to run ahead of what God is doing. All I know is we have a culture that is obsessed with images, that is obsessed with itself, that can be easily deceived electronically. And ultimately, he says, it reveals the number of his name. The number is... 666. It's not three sixes. People have tried to guess throughout history. Who is it? It's Nero. No, you've got to change the spelling of his name to make it add up that way. It's Charlemagne. It's Napoleon. It's Hitler. It's Stalin. It's uh, some president I didn't vote for. It's somebody I don't like. Uh, whatever. No, you don't want to know who the Antichrist is. You figure out who the Antichrist is, you've been left behind. This is for the people that have been left behind to figure out, wow, this is what's going on. Christ has come through the line of Israel, the woman. Satan is in opposition to the things of Christ. Jesus now is in heaven, ascended to the Father. The heavenly war is taking place between the angels and ultimately on earth. The remnant of her seed are fleeing from persecution. The Antichrist has come to power. The false prophet is assisting him. The world is about to plunge itself into chaos. And they're under the mark of the beast because they're under the control of the beast. That's why the message of Bible prophecy is so important and why it's so important that we get it out there. Trust me, you don't want to be left behind. If you are, everything goes wrong. You want to know that when Jesus comes and the archangel shouts and the trumpet sounds, you're ready to go to meet the king when he comes because indeed... The king is coming again. The question is, is he coming for you? My guest today is Dr. Mark Hitchcock, an expert on Bible prophecy. Mark, there are a lot of times when people think they've figured out the timing of what's going on in the Bible, and we've had all kinds of guesstimates at dates for the rapture or dates for the return or dates for the end of the world. Uh, it's kind of like it's the end of the world and uh, we're running out of time and yet there's more time. What's wrong with all that kind of thing in the first place? Well, I always like to say whenever somebody sets a date for when the Lord's coming back, you can be sure that's not the not date. It. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, Jesus himself said the Lord's coming in time and you don't think that he is. And, uh, you know, so when people get all this hyped up and have a date set, you can know that's not the time he's going to come. And, of course, Jesus himself said when he was on earth, 
when he was incarnate on the earth, he didn't even know the time. Now, and I think he knows it now, but in his uh, humanity as the, the God-man here on earth, he didn't even know the time of his future coming. So it's really the ultimate act of arrogance yeah. for someone here on earth to say, well, I know more than Jesus knew when he was here living on the earth. I know the time of the Lord's coming. And usually when people do this, it's a lot of complicated mathematical calculations, and they're going and grabbing something over here, and, you know, the 2,300 days from you know, Daniel chapter 8, and then grabbing this, and they, they put some things together just kind of in, in this concoction. Yeah, or it an just eclipse doesn't make of the sense. sun or something of that nature, right. or they look at what Jesus referred to as the signs of the return, right. and they try to make those signs of the rapture yes. as though that could happen right now. And the, all that date setting and even date suggesting, right. where they don't set an actual date but suggest it's got to be before 10 years at least, right. or before I'm out of here uh, kind of thing. And the older people are, the sooner they want Jesus to come back. And the younger they are, the longer they want him to wait. Right. Uh, does the Bible, I think, make it clear that he'll come in the timing that the Father has set? Yeah, no, that's right. Jesus said in, in Acts chapter 1, he says, you know, it's not for you know the times or the seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority. So we don't know, we don't know those things. And it gives, the, it gives the church and the Bible a black eye mm -hmm. when people in the name of Scripture make these statements and they're, they're false again and again. It, it kind of creates this idea of people that the, they, they think that that's what the Bible says. Yes. They don't realize it's just what that person, person is saying. saying. Yeah. And they, 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 then they think the Bible lacks credibility. And it's tragic and sad when that happens. And we should avoid date setting or even soft date setting of even, you know, like you said, in the next decade or, or something yeah. about date blood moons or, yeah. or all these right. kinds of things. We just yeah. need to avoid those kinds of things. You know, what I always tell people, and they say, well, you know, how soon do you think it's going to be? I just say he could come at any moment. Yeah. That, that's where we need to stand. Yeah. Say Jesus could come back at any moment, and we need to be ready. That, that's the answer we give. I think the bottom line in all of that is don't waste your time trying to guess the time. Be ready all the time because Jesus could come back at any time. And if he could, then you have to ask yourself, am I really to, ready to face him and meet him if he were actually to come today? Amen. Wow. He worried me a little bit there. I thought he was taking... Mark Hitchcock's time. <laughs> Mark will be on again, and he is going to deal with angel proclamations from Revelation 14 to 15. That will be at 10.30. That means uh, we're gonna have about 10.15. The music will be up here. You'll know we'll be getting ready again. But you'll have plenty of time to go over to the gym, and we got plenty of things. I need to tell you that some of the speaker's uh, materials have already been uh, purchased. So I know there's still a lot over there, and they're all anxious over there to see you and uh, to help you in any way you can. Uh, secondly, I mentioned yesterday about the Jewish Bible uh, it's, there's a booth over there with uh, Jerry and Nancy Sands. And uh, if you give them the name of a Jew uh, that you know and an address, they'll give you one of these free to take to them. And uh, it's, it, it's the most marvelous ministry if you've never heard about it. It's fabulous. So you can get that over at the gymnasium. Also, I want to mention that uh, all of, I understand, uh, all of Ed Heinsohn's books are already gone. Well, I've been really excited about it. I think I'm going to go on video. <laughs> Apparently, you can get rid of things faster on video. Oh, I, I need to say something about your program. Uh, I don't know when to say it, but now I have a little time. Um, some of you have been worried about the pictures of all the speakers. Everybody is smiling except the first one, <laughs> which is Jack Hibbs. Boy, has he had a couple of fabulous messages already for us. If you don't have a church home, uh, I'd recommend, hey, 
you should come here uh, tomorrow. Can you imagine what Jack, in, in fact, uh, I slipped into his office and I saw his notes. Oh, wow. I don't think you want to miss Jack tomorrow. He got three services. It's going to be something else. Anyway, let's take a break, and about 10.15, you'll hear the music, and uh, come back in, and we'll be ready to go with Dr. Mark Hitchcock. God bless you. <laughs> 